otherwise it's my pleasure that Dr. Drew Crawford is here to talk to us about the skinny of obesity. He's a gastroenterologist with the Warren Clinic at St. Francis Hospital and now serves as our program director for the Gastroenterology Fellowship. He had his medical degree from OSU College of Osteopathic Medicine and is board certified in gastroenterology. I've heard him speak before. I know we're going to enjoy him. So it's, it's yours. Mic up and uh, I'll mic off. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, good morning. Do we I need to stand on this pad? Okay. Let me just see if I can master this. Do I have my slides pulled up? Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Okay. There we go. So, Drew Crawford, I'm a 96 graduate here. This campus, listening to Johnny talk, uh, it is completely different. It's amazing what we have now. So, Great to see a lot of familiar faces here, and I appreciate you being here. A uh, little disclosure, I didn't name it the skinny on, on obesity. Everybody kind of comes up with these cutesy little names. They're like weed shops. Everybody has to try to come up with the funniest name they can. <laughs> so I didn't come up with a name. Somebody did, but th there we are. So this is the outline of what I'm going to try to go over today. Uh, I want to just discuss the problem on a on a state level a little bit on a national level and then uh, slightly we'll touch on a global level talk about how to measure it how to make an honest diagnosis of obesity a big part of this i want to just talk about the education and confusion surrounding obesity and, and i don't mean the medical education i'm just talking about the general public a little bit of the politics not not democrat versus republican but just the politics of the sugar industry uh, and the weight loss industry We'll discuss exercise, diets, uh, a relatively new field called endobariatrics, and then surgery. So it'll be a broad overview, but I think we'll uh, be able to get something. So let's start by defining it. So obesity, uh, this is the best definition I come across. It's a chronic relapsing multifactorial and neurobehavioral disease wherein an increase in body fat promotes adipose tissue dysfunction and abnormal physical fat uh, resulting in adverse metabolic, biochemical, and psychosocial health consequences. It's a run on sentence for sure, and I know it's a very long definition, but it, but it really gets to the heart of what's going on here, right? We know it's chronic. We know, and I'll show you some data on the relapsing rate of obesity, right? It is, we see patients that they're big, they lose weight, and it comes back. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is, but the, the, really the, the key word here, I think, is multifactorial, right? There's so many things that factor in on obesity uh, from socioeconomic issues, and we'll talk about food deserts, to just uh, psychosocial ease, the ease of which things is uh, that you can obtain food, how things are marketed to us. So it's not just a matter of you eat too much and you don't exercise enough, right? It's easy to blame the patient, but that's really not the problem. So <clears throat> this is interesting. Let's see, do we have a pointer? Is there a pointer on this? Okay. So you can see here, right? You can see the US, Mexico, and Alaska, right? About 30 to 40% obesity. Okay, perfect. Right? So some of the highest in the, in, the, in the world, right? The other area that's kind of interesting is, is the Middle East, right? you got Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Libya here in Northern Africa, Israel, 30 to 40% obesity in those areas. Venezuela. It's interesting, there's a little country here, a little tiny little country called Nauru. It's, it's about 10,000 people. has an obesity rate of 70%. It's the highest obesity rate in the world. An interesting fact. Okay, so here, here's our most current BMI map, and I'm just going to hone in on Oklahoma, right? But clearly we see a lot of obesity throughout, but we're at about 40% obesity in Oklahoma. And let me just show you how that's grown. So in 1990, let's look at Oklahoma. 
we're at about 10 to 15% obesity in 1990, right? A decade later, we're up to 15 to 20. By 2010, we're greater than 30% obesity. And then this is a prediction for 2030 that we'd be somewhere between 60 and 70% of the patients, of the, of the population of our state would be obese. So I'm, I'm just gonna kind of skip over this. I was gonna try to make a comparison to the, the, the epidemic of obesity and compare it to COVID. It's really not a fair comparison, right? One's a very acute illness, one's a very chronic illness. And so we'll, we'll just kind of jump over, but just some interesting stats. In obesity worldwide, there's 650 million adults affected with obesity. Compare that to 470 million that have been affected to date with COVID. That's 12 to 13 percent of the world's population, and over 40 percent of our country. So, not a fair comparison. So, we'll move on. But you know, we put so much focus and so much resources on the pandemic, as we should, and it is an acute problem, and we can't neglect it. But we also have a chronic problem in obesity that we really need to put similar resources to bear on. So how to measure obesity. Um, one thing I think that as physicians that we do is I don't think that we are very good at measuring it and I don't think we're very good at discussing it with the patients, right? I think we all probably say, you know, you need to lose some weight. Maybe that's it, right? Everybody tailors their practice a little different, but there are so many health consequences that we overlook when we're not discussing it with them. So there's multiple ways to measure it. BMI is probably the most widely available and ultimately it's the one that I think is the easiest to do. It's, it's widely available, it's standardized, there's few limitations. If there's a drawback, it's just that everything's done in the metric system, right? So it's a little harder to calculate, but nowadays it's all done online. Here in uh, Tulsa, with the exception of St. John, every system is on Epic. And so it calculates your BMI automatically. So the National Institutes of Health, the American College of Cardiology, the Obesity Society, uh, the American Heart Association, all of them recognize BMI sort of as the, the gold standard. Body fat percentage, um, I'll show you how they do that, but you know, that's sort of cumbersome. You're measuring body fat in different locations, and then you have to put it into a, a computer and it kind of generates your, your body fat percentage, and then you can, you know, sort it out, whether they're obese or uh, uh, obese one, obese two, obese three, or overweight. There's a product called InBody, which is neat, and I'll show it to you, but it's one where you, you, know, you stand on it and, and it, it has like bioelectrical uh, impedance and it sort of gives you all the data that you need, but they're expensive. Waist to hip ratio is felt by the World Health Organization to be the best way to measure obesity, but it's a little subjective and then waist circumference as well. So I'll go into a little more detail on each of these. So this is BMI, um, easily calculated, not so easy to operate the machine, easily calculated in the computers. You want a BMI between 18 and a half and 25, right? <clears throat> you begin to get overweight at 25 to 30, a BMI of 25 to 30. And then this is divided out into class one, class two, and class three. And the significance of that is different procedures are recommended based on what class of obesity you're at. So just eyeballing here, we've got just, you know, a normal physique. Here you start to see, you know, a little abdominal fat. And people distribute fat differently. Men here in this area, ladies more on the backside. Legs begin to get a little bigger. There's less muscle definition than as they get obese. It's interesting as a gastroenterologist, I see patients all day naked, right? I mean, they come in and it's interesting that they're laying on the bed and they'll have their sheet on and we're, you know, we'll have a little discussion. But when we you know, lay the bed down and we have them roll over and you pull the sheet back, it's, it's surprising what clothes hide, right? I mean, everybody knows what they look like, but it's just interesting because we see a lot of obesity that um, I don't think it's necessarily appreciated unless you sort of have my perspective. So, this, I mean, this is obvious. I mean, it's just amazing. Like we don't see this because we're really looking at the backside, but when we talk about like a waist to hip ratio, I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, and life has got to be hard like this. I mean, you just think about these patients having to carry around all this weight 
And, you know, that fat sitting there, it's not just an inert cell, right? I mean, it, it secretes leptin, it's, it has endocrine properties. It actually functions, it's designed to function to help us, but it actually functions in some ways against us. So limitations to BMI, BMI is it, it's not very good uh, in the elderly, uh, the extremely muscular or the sarcopenic, sarcopenic just meaning sort of elderly and uh, with a loss of muscle mass. So it's not great in that population. We don't tend to see a lot of obese elderly patients. So waist circumference, measuring just, just at the waist, just you know what they've got right here. So it's fine, greater than 40 in men is obese, greater than 35 in ladies. The problem is, is that it, it's subjective, right? You take a, 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 a tape measure and you put it on the waist, it, it matters where you put it. So even, even these organizations, the World Health Organization recommends that you go from the top of the iliac crest and the bottom of the rib cage, go halfway between, and that's where you measure, right? The National Institutes of Health just recommend at the top of the iliac crest. So there's a disparity there. So it may not be a huge disparity, but it could be, right? It could make a big difference. And just trying to determine where halfway is, is different. And do you, do you kind of cinch it down? You know, is it, is it loose? So that's one of the problems with this. What we do know, and the reason that we measure central obesity either here with waist circumference or with the waist to hip ratio, is that central obesity correlates directly with metabolic risk, uh, metabolic syndrome, which is you know, hypertension, insulin resistant, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, as well as cardiometabolic risk. Waist to hip ratio is the same thing, right? You measure the waist, measure the hip, and you, there's a ratio between them. Again, you run into the same problem of where do you, where do you get the measurements, right? Because it does make a difference. Uh, you're getting at the same information here, but the World Health Organization recognizes it as a marker for health as well as fertility. And then of course, the serious metabolic conditions listed below. So to add to the confusion, not only is there different places that you measure, but the World Health Organization has different parameters for obese. And then the National Institute for um, Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Disease has yet different markers. So you can see there's all these different parameters to measure, but really BMI is very standardized. And I think ultimately the one that we ought to look at. Body fat percentage is another way to do it where you have the calipers and you measure. Um, eight to 19% in men and 21 to 35% in women is considered normal. So these little calipers right here, I'm sure we've seen them. There's this little device right here at the top. And so when you squeeze these things, the reason that you're squeezing them is you, you squeeze that thing so that you have a uniform pressure on all of it. You line the arrows up. And then this one down here is a little more sophisticated. This is something we might, um, we might use in our office. But these are things just readily available. I mean, everybody that's ordered something from Beachbody probably got one of these as well as a, a, a measuring tape. But this is what I'm talking about. This, you put your thumb on that and you press that, or you press this and this together, line up these arrows, and that way you have a uniform pressure. Then what you do is you go in and you measure, right? You measure the chest, right? You measure it up here, and then the abdomen right here. The thigh is it's vertical. I don't know if you can see here, but you know you, you come out here and you measure. You have to sort of pinch a little harder there. Um, tricep, subscapular, hip, and then the mid-axillary line. So subjective where you get it, when you're pinching, it's going to be somewhat subjective. The data you get, you put into a computer. So again, I'm telling you all these, all of these are accurate. All of these are decent. The BMI is just uniform and really what I would recommend that we go with. This is the in body that I talked about, the bioimpedance that you stand on, and it'll give you great data. It'll give you lean mass, total fat mass, your weight. But the cheapest one of these is about six grand, and they go up to about 20 grand. So, not something that's readily available for most patients. Okay, so kind of what I was talking about, you know, the, the way I see patients and, and, and surgeons see patients on a daily basis is we just get to see them, you know, all there. You see them on the beach too, I guess, but this is just sort of an eye, a way to eyeball it. And, and what I can tell you is we don't see a lot of these, you know, uh, around town, around our state. This is sort of, you know, just more typical.
I think this is a fantastic picture, right? When you look at CT scans, you see you, you see the person, right? And we're all the same. I mean, every one of us looks like this inside, you know, and our skeleton is all the same. We, <clears throat> for whatever reason, we get all this fat deposits <clears throat> in patients. And so when you see this, I mean, it's just interesting to think that when you see a really big person, in the core of all that is this exact same thing, which I know we all know, but I just think this illustrates it so well. And, you know, these CT scans, you guys look at CT scans, you see that core that, you know, what you're looking at. But then when you just sort of look at the outside, you almost don't even notice it, right? You just see all the fat that's, that's surrounding these patients. Okay, so BMI, bring it up, speak with them. And now let's talk about this. This is going to be sort of the, the bulk of the, of the lecture here just the education and confusion surrounding this, right? So <clears throat> let me just give you a little history. In, in the late 40s, early 50s, there was a, a physiologist named Ansel Keys, and he came up with this, uh, this theory that saturated fats, basically fats from uh, animal meat and dairy, was the problem. And so there was a, this big push to lower the intake of saturated fats. And it went through the, I mean, went all the way to the highest levels of the government. It didn't help that in 55, Eisenhower had a heart attack, which just sort of led even more credence to his ideas. So to this day, when you look for a piece of data that shows significant difficulties with saturated fat and obesity or cardiometabolic disease, you'll have a hard time finding it, right? So they, they pushed this through and there was a guy named John Yudkin, and he said, mm, I think it's sugar. I think sugar is the problem. And so there was this big campaign with Ansel Keys, who had quite a bit of credibility, who really discredited him. And there was a lot of lobbying with the sugar industry. So in the end, by the mid-70s, uh, when the government actually came out with uh, recommendations, dietary recommendations, it really went with the model that Ansel Keys had uh, postulated and the idea that Yudkin came up with had just since died. It's interesting, though, Ansel Keys' study, he showed this, this it's called the seven-country study, and he went and he looked at all these countries, <clears throat> and he drew a graph, and he drew a graph that showed heart disease and saturated fat intake. And he drew a graph, and it looked very much like there was a cause and effect. What's interesting is he looked at 22 countries, but when he plotted them out, it just looked like a regular scatter plot. There was no correlation. But he picked seven countries and drew a line. So just credence that when you look at a graph, you should always look at the graph maker, right? There's always a potential bias. So studies have been done looking back at the seven country study and basically have shown that we couldn't put any credence on it, although our entire government policy is based on Ansel Key's hypothesis and his data. So. <clears throat> Along with that, McGovern chaired a committee that ultimately came out with these recommendations, and this is where we're at. And basically, you look at this, fats and oils sparingly, right? Dairy, two to three servings. Meat, poultry, fish. See, this is all consistent with Ansel Key's ideas that saturated fats and dairy were the problem. And then basically, carb-heavy, right? Very carb-heavy diet. That's what our government recommends to us. Still to this day, it's better, but still to this day is what they recommend. This is their, their, their newest deal. It's called My Plate, right? 45 to 65% of our calories should be from carbohydrates. I'm not recommending that you should be on a no carbohydrate diet, but does anybody know what the carbohydrate requirement for human life is? It's zero. There's no absolute requirement for carbohydrate. So this is our, this is our current recommendations. So in addition to sort of all of the sort of misleading information that led to, to, to where we stand now, it just gets even more confusing. What's interesting, though, is, you know, as, as physicians and scientists, like we all recognize that when we start a process, whether it's a study or just we just implement something, right, we have an end goal and we start toward that end goal. If you take a study and you take it through the, uh, the university and then all of a sudden you start noticing some of your patients are dying, right? You stop that study. But we've implemented this policy as a, as a country. We've implemented this policy of high carbohydrate diets. And 
I mean, I, I just showed you like our obesity rate is just trending up and it's trended up for 50 plus years, right? And we're, and, and, and we're not hitting the brakes and saying something's not right here, right? So, yeah. So let's talk about this. So this is a typical nutrition panel, right? So this is one of the things the government did to sort of, you know, help appease people that were saying like, we need more information. And it's a step and they've actually improved this. But what's, what's really interesting on this is we've got, um, there's the recommended daily allowance of various, you know, macronutrients and micronutrients. So you look at this and as a general rule, what I would suggest is if your food has a food label, I mean, one, you should look at it, but really you probably shouldn't eat it. If it has a food label, you probably shouldn't eat it because it's probably not real food. But, and I'm not railing against the sugar industry, like there's some acceptable amount of sugar but their lobby is very strong. And, and I would suggest that the reason that we have such a problem with obesity is because of sugar. But to that end, the initial nutrition panel came out. And if you'll look, there is no amount of dietary recommended sugar, right? This is across all politics, right? Uh, when Clinton was in office, there were some shady things that went on when Bush was in office, the World Health Organization came out and suggested that sugar should consist of 10%, that this number, 10% of your calories should be from sugar or, or maximum. So under the Bush administration, that got kiboshed. Actually, the Bush administration went to the World Health Organization, basically said, if you put that out, we're not paying our, our dues. We're not paying our portion of that. I don't know if you remember when Michelle Obama came in, right, she was railing against the uh, sweetened drinks. And then all of a sudden that went away and it was just move, right? Quit talking about the drinks and all of a sudden it became an issue with exercise. So this is pan political, but, but, but this is just interesting, right? We've got scientific data on what the human needs for everything, except for this one. And, and the only reason that's true is just because of the sugar industry, right? Now they have gotten a little better in that they've updated the panel and they have put added sugars. And, and they, they are recommending now that, that you have roughly about 50, 50 grams of sugar, of added sugar, of added sugar, but not total sugars. So the new panel basically shows the serving size uh, and a little bit larger uh, print and the calories a little bit larger. What's interesting though, is like this serving size, like you can get a, you could get a, a bag of chips, you know, sort of not the big bag, but not the little bag, the sort of the medium bag, right? And people kind of think that's a serving, right? So they get it and they're driving down the road and they're eating it. If you look at it, that's actually like two and a half servings, but people don't really look at that, right? They, they flip it over, they look, the calories are, oops, the calories are big, but the serving size is relatively small. So in fact, those, those bags of chips that I'm referencing, you know, they have like three and a half servings in there. So three and a half servings, each serving is 230 calories. Somebody picks it up and says, oh, it's only 230 calories. They eat the whole bag when in fact they might have eaten a thousand calories, right? So again, just more confusion surrounding all of this. Okay, now I'm just going to show you some cool pictures. This is interesting. It's obviously a can of Coke, 12 ounce can of Coke. Um, this is the updated food label. 39 grams of sugar in this can of Coke. Every calorie from this can of Coke is from sugar. This is 39 grams. I just, I put these together at the house, right? 39 grams of sugar. So carbohydrates have four calories per gram, right? So if you multiply four times 39, it is not 140, right? It, it's 156, it's 156. So so why is it? There's a discrepancy there. Well, the reason is, is high fructose corn syrup is actually 3.7 kilocalories per gram, right? But measure 3.7 times 39, it's 44. So that should be 144 calories that's listed. But it's not, it's 140 because the FDA allows them to round down. So it's interesting, if you look at all of your food products, everything ends in a zero or a five. Right, you, you never pick up a can of anything where it's you know 143 calories. Right, it's always 140, 145. So you do that throughout the day, right? You get a little incremental calories, but 
but in reality, I mean, potentially this is, well, this is 100% of calories from sugar, no matter what. If you use just conventional wisdom, it's 111% of calories from sugar. All right, we're Okies, right? We all go to Sonic, get a Route 44. So, you know, this little thing right here, this little thing right here, that's to put it in your cup holder, right? That's, that's the purpose of it. it. Just so happens to be that this right here is the amount of sugar that's in that. That's 143 grams of sugar. If you take that and fill it up, it fills it just perfectly to that level, right? That's 143 grams, 572 calories of Coke, right? 12 ounces of Coke is one serving. So if you get a root 44, whatever 144 divided by 12 is, I mean, there you are. So, or 44 divided by 12. So it's just, it's misleading and, and, it's, and it's, it's incredible. How about this, M&Ms, peanut M&Ms, right? 43% of the calories are from sugar. Here's a picture of it, right? That's a serving size, that's 12. Anybody ever eat 12 M&Ms, right? I mean, 12 at a time, yeah. right? But you don't eat just 12. So that's one serving size, 140 calories, 43% of them from sugar. Okay, so, you know, somebody cooks dinner, they're gonna make a healthy choice for a salad or a dessert, however you like your fruit cocktail. So they get this fruit cocktail, right? That does seem like probably a better choice than some, but the reality of it is <clears throat> this, if you look at this right here, it says in heavy syrup, right? Fruit cocktail in heavy syrup. So 84% of the calories from a serving of this, a serving that's a half a cup, right? 84% of the calories are from sugar. Some of that's natural sugars, right? Because of the fruit, but 52% of the calories, total calories, 52% are just from the added sugar. Pineapple, same thing, right? Okay, so, so I did this just to kind of illustrate this. So this is canned pineapple, right? 90% of the calories from this are, are from sugar, 55 from added sugar. Compare that to just a pineapple, right? 42%, so 90 in the other, 42 in this. And this is, this is what we call a complex carb, right? It's tethered with fiber. And so you get, you know, it doesn't, when you eat a, um, a fruit like this, right? the fiber slows things down. So you have slower absorption. So you don't get that big insulin spike that then has to come crashing down. So no food label on this one, food label on the other one. That's why I say, if, you, if your food has a food label, find another product. Tang, you guys remember that? Interestingly, you would think Tang, you, I don't know if you remember, it was basically orange sugar that you poured into a, you know, a pitcher and you mixed water with it. That actually has less sugar than that can of Coke. Not much, but a little bit. I love this picture, right? I mean, this is America. I, 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 I have never, honest to God, I've never, I didn't even know these existed. These are called Oreo thins, right? Never heard of them. Then we got regular, then stuff, double stuff, triple stuff. I mean, it just, it just goes on. But from this, what's interesting is two cookies is the, is the serving of the double stuff, right? Which would be this one, right? But only 37% of the calories from that, from fat, or I'm sorry, from sugar. Cinnamon Toast Crunch, this is the most popular cereal in America. Surprised me, I've never had it. About one in four calories is from sugar, right? Look at this, dessert for breakfast. That's what I think cereal is. These are, these are the, the percentage of sugar, right? Honey Smacks, one in two calories. Fruity Pebbles, Lucky Charms, all a third. Honey Nut Cheerios, Fruit Loops, right? People, I don't think understand that, you know, they, they, if we follow Ansel Keys and our current guidelines, right, we should really minimize the eggs and the bacon and all that. So parents will get these. And granted, this is more convenient. But, you know, when you, when you take out these other, what I would suggest are healthy choices and replace them with this, right, it is substantially worse in the long term. Cliff Bar, right, healthy, sort of marketed to runners, bikers. Me, I mean, like, that's what I do, and I've eaten a ton of these things, right? One out of four calories from sugar. That's a uh, orange cream whip yogurt, two thirds of the calories. This is just, just a bag of sugar, so I had to put those pictures, I had to do it, so I just calculated. In that bag of sugar, there's 17,000 calories. <laughs> that is just crazy. I don't think anybody's 
eating a bag of sugar, but give us time, we might get there. So in addition, we've had portion size problems, right? So this is Fiesta Ware. I don't know, has anybody ever, anybody ever heard of Fiesta Ware? It's, you know, sort of an old, old time. These are my grandmother's plates. So she gave them to me. So we eat off of them still to this day. This was a plate and that was a bowl from Fiesta Ware. That bowl is a one cup, you do one measuring cup, put it in there, right? Then this plate is about 25 years old. I think I had this plate when I was in medical school here, right? Literally, I think I had this plate. So you can see it's a little bit bigger, but that right there is the bowl at the same time, that's a two cup bowl, right? So it used to be, you'd eat a bowl of cereal, you, you might've had a cup, now you have two cups. We got this one, we got this bowl probably mm, a month ago, six weeks ago, I don't know. That's three cups, right? Now I've got six kids, four of them are boys, so these things get used. And it's probably okay when you're young, but it's not okay otherwise. It's probably not okay when you're young. So the weight loss industry, right? It is a multi-billion dollar industry. And there's a lot of good associated with it, but just look at how much, how much we're spending every year. This is US, right? 60 billion in 2013, up to 71 billion in 18. Uh, this was projected but missed a little bit. And in 22, it's estimated to grow about 2.6% annually. I think we'll actually see a higher rate of dollars spent in weight loss just because of COVID, right? People put on a lot of weight in COVID. A lot of them work. A lot of these things work, but not all of them work. And it's interesting. There was a study that came out a few years ago where they compared a lot of the weight loss um, companies like Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig and Nutrisystem, and they just looked at them and they looked to see which one had the best sustained weight loss at, I think it was the one year mark. And what they found when they looked at all of it was that Weight Watchers was probably the best. And the reason being was that, it, I, I think, this is my opinion, but I think the reason is, is that Weight Watchers sort of retrains you to think about what you're eating, right? With the other ones, they just give you this and say, eat this, don't eat this. And there's really not a lot of thought into it. But with Weight Watchers, they'll give you a point system and they'll say, you have to, you know, you're, you're allotted 25 points and you can eat those in whatever fashion you want. But at the end of the day, you can't go over that or, you know, to, to be in compliance with this. And so people then begin to realize that a piece of cheesecake might be four points and a piece of fruit is zero, right? And so it retrains the way they think, which is what's really important is that we have an educational shift. And then the other thing that's important is that we need to, when we put a patient on a diet, is to teach them that it's not a finite period of time. It's not like they just, you know, you, you'd go until you lose the weight and then you go back to what you were doing. And that's what we do, right? We don't tell our alcoholic patients, you know, let's, let's get you off the alcohol, let's send you to rehab. Let's get you, okay, you're doing good, all right? So you haven't had a drink for six months, fantastic. You can go to the bar now, right? But what we do is we have these patients get, get down and then we roll them right back into the lifestyles that got them there before. So this comes from Weight Watchers investor relations document. It says the typical customer enrolls multiple times. Our members historically demonstrated a consistent re-enrollment pattern across many years. Approximately 75% of returning members re-enroll at least one more time in the future. And since 1991, our members have enrolled in an average of four separate enrollment cycles. So I think Weight Watchers is the best. And if you wanna invest in it, I guess it's not a bad place to invest. But that right there tells me that it probably doesn't work real well, right? It, it is not, not sustained. It may be the best, but it's just not sustained. So exercise, what's the role of exercise? January 1, right, the gyms are full. Everybody's made a New Year's resolution. They're in there to lose weight. But what's interesting is it, it doesn't, you can't out-exercise a bad diet. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. The current recommendations are 150 minutes a week so about 30 minutes, five times a week. And two of those should be some form of strength training, resistance training. And the reason being is you wanna preserve muscle mass, right? When you're losing weight, you can lose muscle mass. So by doing strength training uh, twice a week, you can preserve muscle mass. So I think this is a great picture, right? Everybody, when they wanna lose weight, they think that they're gonna start running or they're gonna start biking and they're gonna start doing a lot of you know, exercise. It, it is probably the least important of all the things that they do right there, right? Calorie deficit, increased protein, 
weightlifting, good sleep, keeps cortisol levels down, cardio is there. It's not, it's not bad. There's some benefit. But if you're trying to outrun a bad diet and you're overweight or obese, your likelihood of injury goes up. And then if you get injured, then you exercise less and then just compound your problem. So diets. All right. So Stack looked at 811 overweight patients and randomized them to a low-fat average protein or a low-fat high protein, high-fat average protein, or a high-fat high protein diet. Just look at those and think about that for a second. And anybody want to venture a guess at what they found to be the best diet when they randomize these patients? Anybody have any thoughts? Well, I can tell you, it didn't matter. There was no significant difference. When you alter macronutrients in a diet, there was no significant difference at two years, right? Does anybody want to take a guess at what one factor did matter? I mean, it's very common sense, but too early to ask questions, I guess. Adherence, right? You, you put people on a diet, and if they adhere to it, and I mean, it sounds completely logical, right? It's not, I'm not, it's not profound, but it's important, right? Just adherence. So just getting those patients to get on a diet and to stick with them. So if, if the diet doesn't matter, adherence does. So the real trick is just, you know, trying to help dial in which diet works best for a patient. And that's where the metabolic things kind of can maybe help, right? If they're diabetic, maybe a low carb diet is better. If they, if they have heart disease, um, you know, maybe a lower fat diet, right? So you can just sort of help dial that in, but adherence and calorie deficit, right? You just have to cut the calorie. And Coca-Cola came out with this campaign that a calorie is a calorie. Y'all remember that? Not really true. I mean, metabolically, a calorie from sugar is metabolized very differently than a calorie from meat, right? When we eat something or we drink a Coke, right, that sugar just goes straight into our blood system. It goes straight to our liver to be processed. You have this huge insulin spike. And then it comes down. And eventually, you know, you just have chronic elevated insulin levels, right? You just become insulin resistant, right? And that, that's where this all begins. And then the, the cells can't deal with all that insulin. And so then that insulin starts to get stored, right? Insulin, its role is to just sort of partition this energy, right? You're either going to burn it in, in the acute phase, like when you eat it, you're going to burn what you need right then, or it needs to be stored, right? And so eventually, if you're just having all this sugar, you just have these elevated insulin levels, and then you start depositing fat. So timing of meals, right? You remember the old saying, uh, what is it? Eat like a king in the, for breakfast, eat like a prince for lunch, eat like a pauper for dinner. And there's some truth to that. It's interesting, they, they did look at actually eating macronutrients within a meal at different patterns. And if you eat the carbohydrates less, you actually have an attenuation of your insulin spike. So they, they recommend like, you know, eating your fats and some of your proteins at the beginning of the meal. And then as they begin to go, uh, you can add in the carbs. All right. So pharmacology, there are five drugs, five drugs that are approved for weight loss. I'm not going to go over all these. I just put these in, make me look smart, but there's, you know, there's complex interactions, right? Leptin is secreted from our fat cells and our small bowel, right? And it basically and it tries to send a signal to our hypothalamus to tell us to decrease our intake. Ghrelin actually comes from the fundus of our stomach and it's orexigenic, right? It tells us to eat. So, so there's a, a complex interplay and we've got, you know, norepinephrine and GABA. We have all these different things that all correlate in our hypothalamus, which has been sort of the central regulatory area for energy balance. So it's not just, you know, kind of eat and get full. There's a complex system that goes on here. So, pentaramine, right? That was approved in 1960 for short-term use for about three months. It's a norepi releasing agent. At 28 weeks, you have about a 6.8% total weight loss, right? Some potential cardiac issues associated with it, insomnia, dry mouth, and constipation as well. Then there's uh, pentaramine topramate, which is the norepinephrine uh, releasing agent, the same as long as it's coupled with a GABA receptor modulator. A little bit better, 7.8% total weight loss at one year. 
it was approved in 2012 and it's actually for chronic weight loss management. Pentaramine is FDA approved for three months, but we tend to see them patients on it longer. Orlistat, so this is like the second grossest thing I'm gonna show you today. It, it, there's another one that's just incredible, but, but Orlistat is just, a, it inhibits a gastric and pancreatic lipase, so you just don't absorb fat. So you, you have chronic steatorrhea, right? And one of the main side effects is fecal incontinence and flatulence. So you have an obese patient, they're incontinent, they're flatulent, they, you know, they, they start having like fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. I mean, it's not a great product in my mind. Um, Zenical is the prescription version, but Ally, you can actually you can buy it over the counter now, right? So it just basically kind of runs it through you, so to speak. Uh, so Contrave is one, that is, it's kind of interesting, right? It's an opioid antagonist and a reuptake uh, re inhibitor of dopamine and norepinephrine. It actually seems to work fairly well, about a 6.1% total weight loss at one year. The one thing I see with this is it tends to cause a lot of issues with nausea in patients. And so somewhat not tolerated well. If they can stay on it long enough, they, they tend to do okay. And then the GLP-1 uh, agonists are probably the thing that, that we use the most. So 8% um, total weight loss in one year. It's FDA approved for weight loss as well as uh, diabetes. Common side effects, nausea, vomiting, and pancreatitis. Metformin, you see about a five pound weight loss associated with it. It's not FDA approved for weight loss. It is obviously for diabetes, but we tend to see a little bit of benefit with weight loss in that. And then locasferin, I just put that in there because it kind of flew under the radar, but in February of 2020, it was taken off the market. So if you, at this point, you probably wouldn't have anybody on it still because they wouldn't be able to fill it, but no, no screening is recommended, but this was one that was used for a while. Okay, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit in the last few minutes about endobariatrics and then about surgery. So endobariatrics is just that, it's just like endoscopically uh, placed options. So I'll go over each one of these. So th these are just space occupying balloons. Back in the 80s, these were used, they weren't terribly effective, they're coming back, but this one's called the Orbera, and it, it is placed endoscopically, and it's removed endoscopically. <clears throat> you basically fill it with 400 to 700 cc's of saline, and at one year, they have about an 11% total weight loss, right? It's proved in FD, uh, FDA approved in 2015 for a BMI of 30 to 40, so obese patients, right? Interestingly, this and one of the other balloons, FDA approved for patients 22 years of uh, age and older, kind of an odd number, but an even number, but kind of an odd number. Okay, then this is the Obalon balloon system. So this is the same thing. This one, you actually do three balloons over about 12 weeks. So you swallow it as a pill, right? And then it's got this tube connected to it, right? So you swallow this thing and it goes down and you got this tube hanging out of your mouth. And then they, to the end of that tube, they connect a, um, like a pressure device and they, they fill it with gas. And then you kind of get used to that one and you come back and, and then obviously that thing disconnects and the tube comes out, right? You do that three times and so you have these three balloons. Now when you go to remove those, it's in, you have to go in endoscopically to remove them. So each balloon is 250 cc's. So that's 750, so the other one's about 700 cc's. So what the advantage of this over the other is, I couldn't tell you, but about 10% weight loss at six months. Same thing, BMI of 30 to 40, so obese, one, two, and three, age uh, greater than 22. This is, a, this is a, just another variation on this one. This one's not FDA approved in, in our country yet, but this one goes down endoscopically and then you, you fill it endoscopically <clears throat> and then just let this go. And then you can go back in and adjust it up and down. It's got almost a 15% total weight loss at eight months, a significant adverse uh, event rate at 5.3. So this is, this is what's called the primary obesity surgery endoluminal, right? It's part of the incisionless operating platform. Patients, you, you said it's 
product that patients would have bad reflux and we'd go in and we'd do this thing called endo cinch where we take a scope and go down and we kind of sew up the lower esophageal sphincter. And really in the end, it didn't prove to be a whole lot better than a laparoscopic Nissen. And so I don't know anybody that does it anymore, but that same platform they're now using to sort of placate in the fundus or you do the fundus here, so that's the, sort of the outline. So you kind of pull it in, make it a little smaller, or you can do it here on the gastric body, pull it in. But this is the incisionless operating platform. And you can see, I mean, it, it has decent results, 15 to 17% total weight loss with the distal pose. And then there's another one, it's just a competitor. It's the overstitch endoscopic suturing system. Same, same concept, you just go in and do it, kind of pull the stomach in, sort of makes the stomach a little bit smaller. Kind of similar to, you know, like a, a sleeve gastrectomy, 16.5% total weight loss at one year. And then here's the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. This is where they go in with a scope and they just take the, like, like argon plasma coagulator right here and they just sort of mark these lines where they want to do it. And then they just use those platforms and they just pull the stomach together. Makes the stomach smaller. Okay, this is the grossest thing I was going to say about orostat was one. So if, if you don't want to give your patient something to, to poop, there's some pathology here, right? This is like endoscopic bulimia. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I haven't done this. But so basically you put a peg tube in this patient. It's a little, a little bit different than a peg tube. You got this tube going in, right? That's the stomach. This is the abdominal wall, right? That's right outside. So it's going in. This is like a 28 trench tube. It's fenestrated. has holes in it. And so you tell patients, eat whatever you want, just chew your food real good. Chew your food real good. And then after 30 minutes, you hook this little thing up to it and go stand over a toilet and drain 25 to 30% of the calories you just ate, right? I mean, that's not a whole lot different than bulimia in my mind, right? I mean, you can eat it, you can go make yourself puke, or you can eat and do it. You're in a bad situation when you're doing this, <laughs> in my opinion. I don't know. Or the stat or that, it'd be a tough call. That's it. 17.8% total weight loss at one year. I don't know what the, like, what's the longevity of that? Like, how long is somebody going to do that? I, I don't know. So I was going to go over surgery, but maybe I'll just take a few questions. Surgery, I mean, we know the surgery, right? Sleeve gastrectomy, 23% weight loss at one year, 51% ex, uh, extra weight loss or you know excessive weight loss what's over and above what you are normal so it's good kind of falling out of favor a little bit but we still see it lab band is almost completely falling out of favor and then of course the ruin y is the, is the gold standard right one thing that's interesting about the ruin y though or what the typical gastric bypass that i think is very important is all of these patients should have a psychological evaluation right if you carry an extra 50 pounds Maybe you eat a little too much. Maybe your lifestyle just needs to be modified. If you carry an extra 300 pounds, right, probably something deeper going on, right? What we know about gastric bypass is it is the most effective, but there's a five times higher successful suicide rate in these patients, right? So we've surgically removed their coping mechanism. And it's a real problem, right? So it works very well. There's another one called a, a, a duodenal switch, which is showing promise. There's another thing endoscopically where you can go in and you kind of put like a trash liner in through the duodenum. And so it just doesn't, it just bypasses your area to absorb. So there are things coming down the pike, but this is the gold standard, right? It does have some serious consequences, but just make sure that your patients are psychologically prepared for what's going on because you are taking a coping mechanism from these patients. So anyhow, the last, uh, last picture I'm going to show you is this guy. I like this guy. Right, but he's a little he's a little off, right? Worried about his self defense, right? So concealed carry, that's his gun. That's him. That's his gun there, right? So he's prepared ish. Uh, but when you look at it, heart disease kills one in six, cancer one in seven, uh, stroke one in twenty nine, Alzheimer's one in thirty seven, diabetes one in fifty one. All of those are consequences of obesity. Assault by a gun, one in 315, right? He would work to get all this other stuff off. He'd probably be in better shape than having a gun, but he is prepared. So anyhow, that's all I got. And I'm probably getting close on time. Are there any questions or? Yes, sir. Uh, 
this, they'll be able to see the work. Yeah. So again, just commending Dr. Crawford because I think he's right on target with this. Um, as a as a gastroenterologist, we see fatty liver just day in day out. I get so tired of it. I went and re-educated myself because American Heart Association, American Gastroenterological Association, they're wrong. The, the diets that they tell everybody, they tell everybody eat your carbohydrates, restrict your fat, exercise a lot, doesn't work. Um, it's been proven time and time again. I think to the point when we actually put glucose monitors on people, continuous glucose monitors, check their insulin levels, diagnose insulin resistance early, not when they're diabetic. That's when we'll actually start making some headway in treating obesity because we're totally wrong. A lot of it's politics and, and money and pharma and all that stuff. But so I wanted to commend you, Drew. I think you're right on target. And I think uh, as the primary care doctors out there, really look at what you're telling patients. I see this all the time. They, uh, I tell them one thing, they go back to their PCP. They're told, nope, you need to go on a fat restricted, low calorie diet. All you're gonna do be, is miserable and you're gonna fail. It'll work for a little while and then it'll fail if you have insulin resistance. And what we're finding out is people are not, are not the same. You're different than somebody else. And if you wear a monitor around, you'll find out certain foods will spike your insulin levels, one person, but another person it won't. So once we get to that individualized level, we'll, we'll make progress. So that's my two cents. Uh, great lecture. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Mr. Crawford, we have a couple questions from our virtual attendees. Um, the first being talking about the use of artificial sweeteners as compared to sugar. Do you have any preference on how you educate your patients uh, as to which one of those to focus on? Well, there's a, there's a wide variety with the artificial sweeteners, but basically they spike the insulin level in a very similar fashion. So it's not, you're not making a huge difference there. Um, that's about all I'd say on that. The second question speaks about timing of, of meals. Uh, the, the question specifically says that it used to be recommended to always eat breakfast to get your metabolism going at a higher level. Um, thoughts on that, thoughts on utilization of uh, intermittent fasting and, and how you time that out. Yeah, but that's a good question. I think the jury's out on a lot of that stuff still. It definitely used to be eat a big breakfast, uh, kind of a medium lunch, small dinner. Scientifically, that hasn't been shown to do a lot. Intermittent fasting is interesting because it does it, it, it does work, and it's based on insulin levels. Um, yeah, it it works, and like I said on the other one, in even eating your macronutrients within the same meal in a different order matters, right? Insulin resistance and sugar is really the problem, right? So alteration of that and attenuating those insulin spikes makes a difference. Did you have a question? I don't know if anyone does them. I don't do them. I don't do them. They're relatively new. Like I said, in the 80s, they had, the, they had these balloons and um, they just weren't well tolerated. So in time, we'll see. You know, at this point, the gold standard really is surgical intervention, right? And there's not enough information on doing things endoscopically. I mean, it would, it would be intriguing if it comes out and maybe in time uh, we'll do it. But right now, I just think the jury's out on how effective they or any of the endoscopic approaches are. The nice thing about them is these patients are not great surgical candidates, right? And so it's a little less invasive. Well, so if I, if I, if it gets to where they recommend it, it's, it's a gastric bypass. I mean, that is the gold standard. Um, I, I just think there's a, there's a lot of steps before that, you know, where I trained down at Scott and White, they had a uh, bariatric program. There was a, the guy that headed his name was Richard Simmons, oddly enough. It was S-Y-M-M-O-N-D-S. -M -M it was different Simmons, but but from the time you entered the program till the time you had gastric bypass was about one year, right? I mean, it was an extensive, it was an exhaustive program and psychiatrists and psychologists were involved and that was, that was key in nutrition. So really getting all those components as opposed to just somebody operating on you is 
my, uh, would be my recommendation. Work them up appropriately and then get them into. Before we go to the last question, I'm just going to remind you that right in front of you is a little triangular speaker. You hold the button down when you talk. Then the people that are virtual will hear it, and everybody in-house will hear it better, too. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What is a safe uh, caloric restriction for a patient that you're seeing in the office? I mean, they're all different sizes. Mm -hmm. So what is a safe recommendation on a caloric intake and i know you can adjust fats cal and all that stuff sure but what point if i try to talk to them about restricting cal what is safe yeah so i usually recommend about a four to five hundred calorie restriction and it depends on you know what the goal is but about a four to five hundred calorie restriction per day right because usually there's obese patients are eating you know upwards of three four thousand calories a day and then the other thing I, that I think is important is to set a goal of 5% weight loss, right? Because we know if, if patients who have a 5% weight loss, that significantly impacts their uh, risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and arthritis, right? So they hit that 5%, and, and then you can build on that. But so if that, a person comes in and they're 600 pounds, right? you tell them they need to be 180, they're not hearing it, right? I, I, but if I you tell them they need to lose 5%, uh, they're 600 pounds, it's 30 pounds. That makes that makes a little more sense to them. So about 500 calories to answer your question. So we will have about a five minute time frame, and then we're going to start at 8:45 promptly for Dr. Duvall. There are still a couple of online questions. So uh, what I will do is, you know, people at online can get up and go to the bathroom anytime. I'm going to let you all during these next round of questions that we're doing online. Feel free to get up if you need to. Uh, and then we will be starting at 8.45. So let's do the online questions. Dr. Crawford, uh, two unrelated questions I'll, I'll combine into one. Um, first being thoughts on apple cider vinegar um, in the utility and insulin sensitivity and weight loss. And then the other being surgical interventions for weight loss and insurance coverage. Has that improved to your understanding over the last several years? So I don't have any opinion on apple cider vinegar. One way or the other, maybe great. I'm not saying it's not. I just don't, I, I just don't have an opinion on it. Um, weight loss coverage is, is very poor. And not only is weight loss coverage, insurance coverage for weight loss, not only is it bad, but complications that arise down the road is poorly covered, right? Which is, it's a bit unfortunate, right? I mean, the insurance companies don't cover it. Big pharma is involved to make money. And of course the sugar industry. So I'm not saying that they're colluding, but we don't see improved coverage at this point, or I don't personally. All right. Thank you all.